All right, we've got uh, about 15 seconds, it looks like, before we'll be live on YouTube. Okay. If you could just give me a go, that'd be great. All right, and I'm going to do a brief intro okay. um, for you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got some folks filtering in now. So, um, and we're right about seven o'clock, so I think we can start up. Um, so, hi everyone, thank you for attending this presentation tonight. My name is Caroline Hughes, I'm a biologist at the Loon Preservation Committee. And before we start in on our presentation, I do just want to give you a brief background on LPC, who we are, and what we do. So we're a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1975 in response to um, a really dramatic decline in New Hampshire's common loon population. Uh, at that point, there were fewer than 100 pairs left in the state. And so really the founding principle behind LPC was that if human actions had contributed to those declines, um, and it seemed very likely that they had, then human actions could also help to reverse them and bring our loons back. And so since then, that's what we've been working to do through a combined um, set of strategies that include monitoring our loon population, doing management activities like floating rafts and signs to help loons nest successfully, research into the problems that are affecting our loons, um, and then education about loons and the natural world in general. And so tonight we're really excited to be able to provide this educational presentation that is about loons, uh, just not loons in New England. So tonight our presenter is Erica Lemoyne, Erica works at Northland College in Wisconsin. She's the Loon Watch and Citizen Science Coordinator there. Um, and she works with a team of over 500 volunteers to coordinate the annual lakes monitoring program, uh, which is a program that monitors loons on hundreds of lakes throughout Northern Wisconsin. She also coordinates the Wisconsin Loon Population Survey, survey the Sigurd T. Olson Research Award, the Loon Watch Speakers Bureau, the Loon Appreciation Week poster, and the Get the Let Out program. So she's a very busy person um, and we're really uh, lucky to have with her with us tonight. So Erica, thank you so much for being here um, and feel free to take it over whenever you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Caroline. Um, good evening, folks, and thank you for attending my presentation. As Caroline mentioned, um, Loon Watch is based at the Sigurd Olson Environmental Institute at Northland College. I am gonna be covering a lot of information, different kinds of information during this presentation tonight. And so on this slide is my contact information. So if you find that you have questions after the presentation, please feel free to contact me e either via the, um, the email or the phone number here. And I'm sure Caroline will put that up too on the chat function. Okay. So I'm gonna start with a quote from Sigurd F. Olson, who is our Institute's namesake. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes now for some creative visualization because Sigurd's words tend to evoke the memories and feelings of being on a lake with loons, which is what I think we're all missing right now. Above came a soft whisper of wings. And as the loons saw us, they called wildly in alarm and took the laughing with them into the gathering dusk. The shores echoed and re-echoed until they seemed to throb with the music. This was the symbol of the lake country, a sound that more than any other typifies the rocks, waters, and forests of the wilderness. Sigurd F. Olson, listening point. So just want to give you a little background about Sigurd Olson too. Um, besides being our institute's namesake, he was an American author of nine books. And these books really speak to the spiritual and human need that we all have for wilderness. He was also an environmentalist, and an advocate for the protection of wilderness. He was influential in the protection of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in Minnesota, and he helped draft the Wilderness Act of 1964. He also helped establish Minnesota's Voyagers National Park, Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and Point Reyes National Seashore in California. Uh, he served as vice president of the Wilderness Society 
and he also served as president of the National Parks Association and a member of its board of trustees. And then Sigurd P. Olson, Sigurd F. Olson's son, um, did his master's thesis that was called The Common Moon in Minnesota. So this baseline work was really important to a lot of future research. And our research award that Caroline mentioned also bears his name. So as the name indicates, Northland College is located in far northern Wisconsin in Ashland, Wisconsin, near the shores of Lake Superior. And the initial goal of Loon Watch was to organize volunteers to monitor loons in Wisconsin. And today, and, and really throughout our history, we have been just helping people help loons. Um, Loon Watch got its start in citizen science. Um, back in 1978, approximately 24 citizens um, got together because they wanted to know more about the health of our loon population. And they started monitoring lakes throughout Northern Wisconsin. Um, but there's a really great backstory to our beginnings. And it has to do with the Loon Preservation Committee. Um, so I think probably a lot of you from New England will recognize these names, Ross and Wood and Buck Corson. And back then, back in 1978, it was called the New Hampshire Loon Preservation Committee. Um, and just a, more background, Gary Chalwick um, is the name of uh, Loon Watch's first coordinator back in 1978. And it actually so happens that Gary lives just a hop and a skip away in Washburn, Wisconsin. And I have been very privileged to have some great discussions with Gary. He has just tons of interesting stories about his life. Um, and he also um, was telling me a lot about the, the history of the beginnings of, of Loon Watch here in Wisconsin. And um, I'm just sort of giving you a background of what I remember from my conversation with him, from his recollections. He said that Ross and Wood and Buck Corson from the Loon Preservation Committee called our director at that time, Virginia Prentice, and congratulated her on starting a volunteer Loon Watch program, um, to which Virginia replied something to the effect of, we did what? <laughs> um, so in the ensuing conversation, uh, Ross and urged Virginia to start a Loon um, monitoring program with volunteers. And, and really um, influenced her and, and um, convinced her that this was something that we should do at the Sigurd Olson Environmental Institute. So at the next SOEI staff meeting, Virginia described the proposed program and asked if anyone was interested in spearheading it. Um, and then Gary um, Chalwick said he immediately piped up and volunteered to start the program. And at the time, Gary was a student at Northland College. And very interesting background, Gary was a non-traditional student at Northland College and, um, and a Vietnam veteran. So you can imagine coming back from the war, um, going up to Northern Wisconsin, having this opportunity to start this remarkable program. It was just up Gary's alley. Um, he was worried that he would not find enough volunteers um, to, to do this monitoring, but his worries were pretty soon um, relented because there were so many people who wanted to, to participate and wanted to know more about what was happening with loons in northern Wisconsin. So I have to do a shout out of many thank yous to the past and present folks at the Loon Preservation Committee. Without them, we would not have this program. And Loon Watch is actually the longest running program at the Figure Dolphin Environmental Institute. So thank you, Loon Preservation Committee. I also wanted to provide some information about some of the other um, programs here in the upper Midwest that you may not be familiar with. Um, in Michigan, um, citizen scientists are monitoring loons for the Michigan Loon Preservation Association. Um, they do a program that is similar to Loon Watch's annual lakes monitoring program. And this is where volunteers monitor ideally throughout the nesting season on lakes of their choice. So the Michigan Loon Preservation Association has approximately 400 loon rangers that cover 47 count Michigan counties on 684 lakes. So a lot of these loon rangers are monitoring more than one lake. And this is their website. Um, and again, if you just um, Google um, citizen science and loon rangers in Michigan, um, you can probably get this. And um, similar to for Minnesota. So in Minnesota, the Department of Natural Resources, a state agency, um, conducts the, the loon monitoring, the volunteer loon monitoring programs. And so very similar to what we do at Loon Watch, 
Michigan also has two different um, volunteer monitoring programs. One is a, a monitoring program where, um, again, volunteers go out on a lake of their choosing and monitor throughout the nesting season, ideally. Um, and then they have a separate program that is a population survey where volunteers count the number of adult loons and the number of loon chicks. So those are a little bit different. So um, the, the volunteers that do the monitoring program throughout the nesting season, there are 124 volunteers who monitor 168 um, or 160 lakes across 26 counties during the breeding season. So they're, they're um, you know, looking at um, phenology and productivity information, the so number of territorial pairs, um, the chicks produced, and, and when all of that is happening. Um, and then again, they have this um, population survey and approximately 1,000 volunteers participate in this. Um, the survey is on, on 600 lakes across six index areas. Um, and so you can see on this map, those six um, different little um, index areas. Both of these programs are annual. And again, those, those lakes in the index areas are, are not lakes of volunteers choosing, it's part of the population survey. And that's similar to what we do at Loon Watch. Um, another program that, um, that both the Minnesota DNR and the Pollution Control Agency are doing is a restoration of Minnesota, Minnesota's loons due to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, they've received funding from the Open Oceans trustees to do projects that restore the loon population by way of getting the let out program, um, acquiring loon breeding habitat, and providing nesting platforms. And um, again, you can, you can Google this pretty easily, but there's the, um, the website um, if you're interested in learning more about the loon restoration projects in Minnesota. So I, I felt that I would be remiss, um, especially if I'm giving this presentation to, to a lot of New Englanders, not to include a Wisconsin primer. So yes, we are the dairy state. We love our cows, we love our milk, we do love our beer, our bratwurst. And we are, a lot of us, big cheese heads and big Packer fans. But you should know that Wisconsin is serious about its cheese. Uh, Wisconsin is the largest cheese producer in the United States, making over 600 different cheese varieties. And it's the only state that requires a licensed cheese maker to supervise the making of commercial cheese. So becoming a licensed cheese maker takes between one to two years 240 hours of interning under a licensed cheesemaker and passing a written test. That's just so you could sell cheese in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin is also the only state to offer a master cheesemaker program. So that's kind of like getting a PhD in cheese, pretty exciting. Um, and it's patterned on the rigorous standards of similar programs in Europe. But to become a master cheesemaker is a three-year commitment and requires that you have been a licensed cheesemaker for at least 10 years before you can even be considered for the Master Cheese Maker program. Again, we're pretty serious about our cheese in Wisconsin. We also are big into hunting. Um, the Saturday before Thanksgiving marks the start of deer season, or in Wisconsin, we call it deer holiday, and a lot of people take that week off. Um, and soon after that, it's usually followed by ice fishing, which is definitely happening right now. We have these cold temps up here. Um, but if you are out in the woods during hunting season in Wisconsin, you need to make sure that you're wearing blaze horns. That is a safety measure. Um, in Wisconsin, we have the term, the vernacular term, up north. And so we love, love our northern woods and waters. We, we enjoy them tremendously. Um, hiking, spending time on um, lakes and, and just out in nature is something that we love to do. The up north vernacular region of Wisconsin is located here. And as you can see, most of Wisconsin's northern land cover is deciduous and coniferous forests and lots and lots of lakes and wetlands. In fact, 85% of Wisconsin lakes are located in the northern part of our state. And you can find all the different types of lakes that you can imagine um, in Wisconsin. So there are small seepage lakes, spring-fed lakes, drainage lakes, flowages. Um, pictured here is the Eagle River chain of lakes, which includes nine lakes that span almost 4,000 acres. And this is just one of many chains of lakes. Um, this is the chip, part of the Chippewa flowage that's been photographed. Um, 
This is a 15,300 acre impoundment. Uh, back in 1924, the water was backed up from 11 natural lakes and nine streams. Ice fishing is a big deal here in the upper Midwest. Lots of folks look forward to lakes freezing. And this time of year, um, it's really important to check the ice depth to make sure it's safe. So in this photo, this is my nephew Mitchell using an ice chisel to accomplish that task. Generally, you want a minimum of four, inch of, uh, four inches of ice for ice fishing or walking out on the ice, five to six inches for snowmobiles and ATVs, eight to 12 inches for cars and small trucks, and 12 to 15 inches for medium sized trucks. So ice fishing is often a family affair and we start them pretty young. So many of us discover our Northern lakes by way of memorable camping vacations here in Northern Wisconsin. And once the ice is out, we're gonna spend time in canoes, kayaks or motorboats, or just hanging out um, in the lake, um, this time is really precious to us. <laughs> um, catching a muskie is a badge of honor here in northern Wisconsin, and everyone just loves a fresh walleye fish fry. And then we have a couple of our northern lakes icons in really giant form here in Wisconsin. Um, Mercer, Wisconsin is known as the loon capital. And you can't miss the giant 16 foot one ton loon as you travel through Mercer. Mercer is also famous for Mercer Loon Days, which is a huge craft fair featuring an infamous loon calling contest, which Loon Watch sometimes helps judge. And then Hayward, Wisconsin is home to the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame and Museum. The giant muskie pictured here is one half city block long and four and one half stories tall is constructed of concrete, steel, and fiberglass and is part of the museum complex. Um, that complex houses over 50,000 sport fishing historical and vintage artifacts, 300 mounted fish, and about 1,000 antique motors. All of that is on display in the Muskie and in other parts of the museum. So the, the, um, the, fish water, the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame is also the last word on freshwater fishing records. So if you think you've caught a record, you're gonna to need to have it authenticated here. And then lastly, lake culture in the upper Midwest. Um, fish fry is a huge tradition in Wisconsin and it began because Wisconsin was settled heavily by Catholics of German, Polish and other backgrounds whose religion forbade them for eating meat on Fridays. So fish is apparently not considered a meat. And um, the number of lakes in the state meant that eating fish became a really popular alternative. Um, Scandinavian settlements in northern and eastern Wisconsin favored the fish boil, um, which is a variant on the fish fry where um, potatoes, other vegetables, white fish, and salt are heated in a, in a large cauldron of water. And then up here in northern Wisconsin, we have a lot of delicious smoked fish from Lake Superior. Very lucky up here. So now we're going to pivot and talk about Loon Watch's programs in a little bit more detail. Um, so Loon Watch has two main components to its programming, um, the research and monitoring. And so um, just a little bit more information about the annual lakes monitoring program. Um, again, it is a, um, a program where volunteers monitor ideally from ice out to migration on a lake of their choosing. Um, the Wisconsin Loon Population Survey occurs once every five years on a set of pre-selected lakes in the middle of the summer. And then the Sigurd T. Olson Loon Research Award is a competitive grant that is awarded once every other year. It's a $5,000 grant award. Then our education and outreach comprises of our Speakers Bureau program. Um, and so we have volunteers throughout Northern Wisconsin who provide presentations, parts of which are similar to what I'm providing tonight. Um, the Loon Appreciation Week poster. Um, so we have a photo contest and the winner of the contest has their photo graced the following year's poster. And there's an educational back to that poster. And Moon Appreciation Week is the first week of May, or I say any week that you would like to appreciate loons. And then our Get the Let Out programming is really integrated into everything that we do because it is so important. We also have a display that we lend out to lake associations and other organizations that are interested in showing 
um, examples of lead and non-lead tackle. And this is just the glue that holds all of our programming together. So this is um, this year's Loon Appreciation Week poster image. Um, if you're interested in purchasing that poster, it's available for sale on our website for $7 um, a piece. So a little bit more detail about our Wisconsin Loon Population Survey. As I mentioned, it's every five years. It was established back in 1985. So last year's survey was the eighth survey. Volunteers are accounting just the number of adult loons and loon chicks that they see. They're not um, taking any other information. Um, this is conducted on a set of 258 pre-selected lakes through 27 northern Wisconsin counties. So they can't select a lake of their choosing. It has to be one of our pre-selected lakes. And these are random stratified selection of lakes. Um, it's based on size class. So it's supposed to be representative of, of lakes that um, loons might occupy during the breeding season. And the survey is completed on one day. Um, it's a Saturday in the middle of July between 5 a.m. and 10 a.m. So the folks that commit to doing this, it's really important that they, they carry through because we do this only once every five years. And here's the results of our population estimate for adult common loons in Wisconsin. Um, back in 1985, uh, the population was approximately 2,358. Um, and it, it really, it increased by about 1% per year until 2015. And then our most recent population survey showed just a slight decline to 4,115 loons. Um, but it was well within the standard error. So it's, it's possible that it's a little higher or even a little lower. Um, and it is, it is a concern point and um, it is also very interesting. So again, our annual lakes monitoring program is sort of the bread and butter of Loon Watch and was established in 1978 by, um, by Gary Chalwick. And um, volunteers can choose any lake in the northern part of the state where we have breeding loons um, or lakes. Some volunteers um, do uh, monitor a number of lakes. And um, it's coordinated annually. Um, ideally, volunteers are monitoring from ice out to migration, although we'll take whatever data we can get. And loon, um, loon rangers, which we affectionately call our volunteers, are collecting productivity and phenology data. So we want things like ice out, arrival dates, departure dates, um, the number of territorial pairs, floaters, nesting pairs, nesting attempts, number of chicks that were produced, and the number of chicks that survived to eight weeks. And I'll show you a little bit more detail about that in a couple of slides. So this is um, the result of, um, of all that monitoring. Um, so the, the blue line shows the number of lakes that were monitored every year since 1978. Um, and that's the same in both of these charts. The top chart shows the number of territorial pairs. Um, and then the bottom chart shows the number of chicks that survived to eight weeks. Lots of data since 1978, pretty cool. So what do our annual lakes monitoring program citizen scientists, what kind of data are they collecting? I think it's easier to have a visual. Ideally, again, weekly from ice out to migration, they are documenting the presence of territorial adults. What are those? They are loons that are part of territorial pair and they are defending territory if it's a small lake, they're usually defending the entire lake from other loons and, and a lot of other wa water birds too. Um, if it's on a large lake, it's usually part of that lake. Um, usually on a large lake, it can be anywhere from 50 to 150 acres. And so we want volunteers to be able to identify territorial adults. And we get into more detail during, during our workshop, um, but that's, that's what we're asking for. We want to know um, if possible, um, this is more difficult on a large lake, but we'd like to know about the number of floaters. The floaters are, are loons that are not part of territorial pair. Um, oftentimes in the beginning of the season, you only see single floaters. And then as, um, as some of the territorial pairs may be unsuccessful, they start to join those other floaters. And they're in groups usually by, by mid to late July. Um, floaters can intrude on territory and sometimes will evict a resident loon and, um, and become part of that and be part of that new territorial pair. So floaters are very interesting to us, knowing the number of floaters and how often we see territorial disputes. Um, we like loon rangers to try and capture that information if they see it. Um, the proportion nesting. So there could be a territorial pair on a lake, 
but for whatever, for whatever reason is not nesting. We wanna know how many are nesting and how many are not nesting. Um, the number of nest attempts, again, for whatever reason, um, there could be a number of reasons um, from territorial eviction to um, predation to just um, the eggs not being viable, um, a number of reasons why there um, would not be um, successful nesting attempt the first time and maybe the second time or even third time, maybe they may um, try different attempts. Clutch size. So if moon rangers can see it, we don't want them getting too close, but if they can see the number of eggs, that's really interesting to us as well. And then nest success. Did those chicks successfully hatch? Um, even if they hatched and only survived for an hour, that is considered nest success. And then chick survival. Are they surviving to eight weeks of age? We think that if they survive to the age of eight weeks, they're probably going to make it to migrate. So there are a lot of threats to loons. I'm going to touch on some of the, the main threats that I think are really important. And I'm sure in New England um, that you are seeing these threats too. But there are some really interesting, I think, specific examples that I'm touching on for, for Wisconsin as well. The loss of habitat is probably one of the biggest threats to loons. Um, I think this is an interesting map. This is the past and present common loon breeding range in North America. Just to interpret that dashed line is the historical southern limit of where loons used to breed. And then that dotted area is where um, loons are currently breeding. So if you look at this map, you know, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Ohio, northern Indiana, northern um, Illinois. Um, even into Iowa, we were seeing breeding loons back in the back in the 1800s when people were paying attention to breeding loons. And here in Wisconsin, um, this is the current distribution of nesting loons in Wisconsin. And so this is from the Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas. And then this is a really great map. I think I think Kevin Tino put this map together. I'll have to forget. I need to find out. Um, but anyways, um, this map shows. Um, historic breeding um, distribution. And you can really see how, um, by looking at this map, whoops, where's my arrow, um, how they move north. So those stars show where there used to be um, breeding, breeding accounts back in the late 1800s. Um, those um, purple and blue areas are um, places where back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s, we were finding breeding rooms. And then they've been pushed really quite far up north. But even our northern regions of Wisconsin are under threat. Um, and this is, this is an interesting series of maps that I want to show you. Um, this is a housing density maps for northern Wisconsin. This is 1940. And what I want you to pay particular attention to is the, the colors here. So the light yellow areas are zero to five housing units per square mile. And as you get darker orange and into the red, it's more and more housing units per square mile. Those dark red areas are 360 or more housing units per square mile. I want you to pay attention to these blue areas too. So that's the areas where we have great density of lakes. So this is 1940. I'm gonna fast forward to 1990. We love our lakes. I'm gonna fast forward to 2010, another 20 years. We really, really, Love our lakes. And I am a transplant from southern Wisconsin, guilty. Um, but we, we really need to, to pay attention to how we are treating the land around our lakes so that we are protecting the flora and fauna that really brought us up here. What we love about northern Wisconsin is what we have to keep when we move up here. Um, poor water quality tends to go hand in hand, um, unfortunately, with, with loss of habitat and development. So loons are, are visual predators. This loon is doing something that we call peering, and it's probably looking for something to eat. They need clear, clean water to be able to see and pursue their prey. Uh, Mike Meyer did a lot of really great work on mercury and loons, but he also you know, investigated um, some other data sets too. And he looked at Pecky disc readings, which is a measurement of water clarity from Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network. And then he compared that to the presence of loons on those lakes. And he found an interesting correlation, <laughs> probably not too surprising when you think about it, but to interpret this, um, this chart, this um, indicates greater than 20 feet of water clarity. And to interpret this, 
um, 70% of, um, of lakes that have greater than 20 feet of water clarity are occupied by loons. And then as you go into decreasing water clarity, so that, that means like if you're looking down, you're seeing more than 20 feet down. That's like world-class water clarity. Then as you go um, for less and less water clarity, less presence of loons. Um, less than five feet of water clarity, only about 20% of those lakes are occupied by loons. The loons are a sentinel species. They are an indicator of healthy aquatic ecosystems. We wanna keep loons around, we have to keep our lakes healthy. Lead tackle, oh, you are so lucky in New England to have these laws that, um, that prevent the sale of these small lead tackle. We have unfortunately a lot of, um, a lot of death of loons and a lot of other water birds because of lead tackle. So 20% of the loons that have been necropsied in Wisconsin died because of lead poisoning and that's totally preventable. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's very, very difficult to, to see this happening, but, um, but again, you know, we don't have those laws in the upper Midwest and, and we need your help. <laughs> We need to figure out how to do that. We have been attempting to do that, but, but have not yet been successful. Human disturbance, um, boy, there's so many different types of human disturbance, unfortunately. I think what comes to mind for the most part um, and that we see a lot of is, is boating. So those motorboats you see in the top pictures, um, especially when, when loon chicks are young and hatching, um, those chicks pop back up like little corks. And so they cannot dive deeply and the parents are, are very protective of them. So if you're not looking carefully, you could run over um, a loon parent, loon chicks, and it's almost always fatal, unfortunately. Also when um, boats produce large wakes, they can erode shoreline and they can wash over loon nests. And, um, and, and that can be very destructive. Um, I think those quiet water sports are kind of less obvious. So when we're canoeing and kayaking, we're not really hanging out in the middle of the lake, right? We're, we're sort of hugging the shoreline. And during nesting season, this can be pretty dangerous for loons because if you suddenly startle a loon, it can jump off the nest and the eggs go in the water with it, or it can leave the nest and it's not going to come back until it feels safe. So if possible, when you are participating in these quiet water sports, try to find out where loons are nesting and avoid that area. At Loon Watch, we like to recommend using the 200 foot rule and keeping a distance of 200 feet from loons. So there are a lot of emerging threats too. Um, and again, these are, and I would say climate change is an emerged threat. Um, these are also um, really detrimental to loons and a lot of wildlife. Um, and I know that you're experiencing this in New England as well, but I think it sort of bears repeating. So some of you might be familiar with the Audubon climate change maps for hundreds of bird species. This map series is specifically for the common loon. The maps were created based on Audubon's climate change model for the common loon, and they start in the year 2000 and go through to 2080. Um, according to Audubon, by 2080, loons are forecast to lose 56% of their current summer range and 75% of their current winter range. So their summer range is this yellow area, their winter range is the blue areas. I'm just gonna click through. This is, this is the year 2000. 2020, 2050, and 2080. By 2080, they're all but extirpated from the lower 48 and just hanging out really in the northern parts of Canada and in Alaska. And I think this really goes along with climate change, these ex extreme precipitation events. So sort of ironic and in mentioning this, we are really in a year of drought here in Wisconsin. This past year has been pretty dry. But the 10 years before that were really wet. And you can see um, on, this, on this graph, this goes back to 1900 and it shows these um, dark teal areas are um, times when we had a lot of precipitation and then the light teal areas are times of drought. But they only go to 2014. So 2010 to 2014 is the most um, extreme precipitation events that we've seen. And you can get this graphic at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration National Centers for Environmental Information State Climate Summaries. That's a word full, um, a mouthful really. 
Um, but you can Google this and you can get that information for your state. And I found what I found interesting about this is that they define extreme precipitation events as the annual number of days with precipitation above two inches. Folks, we've seen that a lot here in the upper Midwest. And I just wanted to provide some examples. And what I'm hearing, and this is anecdotally from Loon Rangers, you know, it's I'm getting calls, I'm getting emails, and sometimes they're putting it on their monitoring forms in the comments section. These rain events are causing problems for our loon habitat, and sometimes they're flooding out nests. So June 19th to 20th, this could be the end of um, nesting season. If there's, especially if there's second nesting attempts, they're still nesting during this time frame. And so this was an incredible um, rain event, especially for Duluth, Minnesota. I don't know if you remember seeing that in the news, but also for Northern Wisconsin. So there are five counties, Douglas, Bayfield, Ashland, Iron, and Sawyer counties that, that really saw a great deal of precipitation. So anywhere from um, two to um, five inches dropped within this two day time frame, and did affect um, some nesting loons. Um, another rain event. So this is July 14th and 2016 even greater swath and more intense um, rain fell on July 14th in 2016, anywhere from two, 10 inches fell on this day. Um, people remember this, it was, it was terrifying for a lot of people who were in the middle of this rain, who were caught in the middle of this rainstorm. And I did hear from a lot of loon rangers that said, hey, our nesting habitat is underwater. And, and so what this says to me is that loon rangers who are really involved and really want to help protect their loons and help their loons is that we need to be pretty nimble. So, you know, if, if they were using natural nesting habitat locations on an island that may be underwater, then maybe it's time to try and offer them an artificial nesting platform. If we get into these drought events and they're seeing, you know, this island reemerge and the loons going back then pull that um, artificial nesting platform back in unless they choose to use it. So, so I, I think that you know we need to pivot and, and be nimble ourselves um, when it comes to protecting our loons and hopefully keeping them here. And again, this, um, this had a huge impact on, on human infrastructure too. Um, this is a person and washed out gullies and culverts and um, washed out bridges here. Um, this took um, over a year for some of this stuff to get fixed. It was, it was um, a really trying time in northern Wisconsin. Another rain event happened. This was the Father's Day storm of 2018. Even greater swath of northern Wisconsin. Um, this just floors me as I look at these maps. So, you know, anywhere from three to 15 inches fell. And this was because of this was being toward the end of June, we did lose some moon nests. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I remember a loon ranger calling me and asking me, you know, the, the eggs are underwater, what should I do? And they ended up putting them on land adjacent to where the nest was. Balloons um, still incubated, and those eggs hatch. So um, that was that was pretty remarkable. But but this is definitely you know when you have this much rainfall in one time, um, lake levels are going to rise. And because you know it wasn't just this rain event, but we had lots of rain during this this really ten year period of time. A lot of um, a lot of lakes were way way high compared to um, what they normally were. And again, here are some of the some of the infrastructure problems we had. This is near Ashland at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. Highway two was almost completely underwater. A lot of it had washed out west of Ashland, so it it um, it affected a lot of people, a lot a lot of their commutes for a long period of time. And then um, just wanted to mention. Um, Walter Piper, he has been doing um, studies on Wisconsin lakes since 1993. And he's, um, he's looking at um, sort of this production line of loons. It's really interesting what he's doing, you know, from chicks to breeding adults. He's been able to do this because he's been banding loons for all of these years. Um, when you ban loons, you put two color bands on one leg a US Fish and Wildlife Service band and another color band on the other leg. And then depending on whether they're a chick or an adult, um, I believe with a chick, it's the US Fish and Wildlife Service band is put on the left leg. With an adult, it's put on the right leg. That helps us identify if 
the um, balloon that's returning was a chick that was um, a, an adult that was banned as a chick. And no two loons have the same color combination. So it's kind of like giving a loon a visible social security card. And Walter is then able to identify individuals. So why is this important? Because he can tell if adults that were banded as juveniles are returning. Um, he can tell if there's evictions, a new territorial loon, if the same pair is returning, et cetera. Lots of interesting, um, important data that he's collecting. But some of the data that he's collecting has, has um, been of a lot of concern. So um, from 1993 to 2019, the incidence of chicks reaching five weeks of age has fallen annually by 1.1%. Um, those chicks have weighed less and there have been fewer two chick broods and a decreasing floater population. So this sort of indicates, in my opinion, this production line of loons is, is starting to possibly fail. And our uh, population survey uh, may be reflecting what he is seeing in real time out there. And so our 2025 population survey, our 2030 population survey is going to be really critical and um, sort of seeing if this is um, actually happening with um, our loons in all of Northern Wisconsin. But he is, he is um, uh, monitoring about 100 lakes in Oneida County, which is right there um, for, his, for his study. Another emerging issue is big wake boats. And I know that you're having these issues in New England. Um, we are fortunate. Um, the Loon Preservation Committee and a lot of other loon organizations for the last year, we've been meeting monthly as part of a working group. And this has been one of the subjects we've been talking about because it is becoming problematic. Um, so the larger the wake, you know, the, the greater the potential for undesirable effects. So again, this can wash out loon nests. This can cause shoreline erosion and loss of habitat. And if the boats, um, these big white boats, if they're running a full wake in less than 25 feet depth of water, it can churn up sediment and that sediment will release dormant nutrients and that can trigger algal blooms, which decreases water clarity, which we know blooms like that, that great water quality, that high water clarity. In Wisconsin though, we do have some protections, although unfortunately not enforced. Um, now obviously it's unlawful to chase, harass, or disturb wildlife, but I think what a lot of folks don't know is that you are, it's illegal to throw a wake within 100 feet of the shoreline, uh, dock, raft, pier, or restricted area. And, um, and it's unfortunately not enforced, but you know, maybe as we're consider continuing to see problems, maybe hopefully we will see uh, more enforcement. You know, the, the manufacturers of these big wake boats, they wanna see people doing the right things too. Their recommendation is that they operate these boats in um, 25 feet of water or more for optimal um, efficiency and um, operation. So, um, you know, if we, we just all do the right thing, um, we won't have these horrible issues, but, um, but it's on the forefront and we're, we're very concerned. So I don't like to put all this gloom and doom out there without providing some, some um, solutions for that gloom and doom. So what can be done to protect loons? Probably one of the best things that you can do if you have lakeshore property is to restore your shoreline just even the first 15 feet of your shoreland from, from this Kentucky bluegrass with these short root systems um, to native plants with these much deeper root systems. The root systems act like sponges, they absorb water. So if you can imagine on a warm summer day, I know it's beginning of December, but imagine being on your lake shore on a warm summer day if we're walking across that lawn, that lawn feels warm, right? So if you get a rain event that's washing, and if you have this, this infinity lawn that goes down to the lake shore and a rain event is washing all of the nutrients. A lot of people fertilize their lawns when they have lawns that look like this. All those nutrients are washed down into the lake shore and that water is warmed because that, that grass is warm. And what happens is those nutrients are really algae feeders. So they feed these algae blooms. And because we have this warm water, heat speeds up chemical reactions. And so we have algae brooms much sooner than we normally would. Um, so what you can do is to restore just the first 15 feet of your shoreline with these native plants. They can be planted very purposefully and look like a beautiful, beautiful flower garden. These root systems absorb all that water. 
and they cool it and they clean it and they keep pollutants from getting into the lake. Um, so that is, that is a really great solution. And it also provides habitat. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you had a nesting loon on your shoreline? You have to be very careful though, but, um, but a great solution. And again, getting the lead out and properly disposing of your monofilament line, um, you, you don't have as much problems as we do in the upper Midwest with, um, with lead tackle. Um, but hopefully maybe you have these, we have the Wisconsin DNR has this wonderful monofilament line recycling program. If you don't have that, you properly dispose of your monofilament line, you cut it into six inch lengths. That makes it safe for wildlife. They won't get tangled up in it. Um, use the 200 foot rule and let people that you know, know about using that 200 foot rule. Um, so keeping a distance of 200 feet from loons is, um, is usually a very safe option and helps keep the loons from feeling threatened and lets them do their natural behavior for you. And then, um, and then educate your fellow lake users. Loon Watch sells these loon alert and lead alert signs. We have, um, we have a lot of great uh, fact sheets on our, on our website. We have a three page fact sheet that is full of, um, of monofilament or of um, lead free manufacturers and retailers. Um, we also have a help protect loons fact sheet. So if you see someone who maybe not using great loon etiquette or great lake etiquette. Um, these, these fact sheets I think can be great icebreakers um, and help you approach someone. Um, I think most people wanna do the right thing, especially if they um, suddenly realize that they're you know, maybe getting a little too close to loons. Um, you can help them and, and inform them and maybe even give them that fact sheet to let them, um, to let them spread that information as well, but only if you feel safe doing so. Um, and I'm sure that the Loon Preservation Committee also has these fact sheets. Maybe Caroline can speak to that after the presentation too. Um, so those of you in New England can, um, can get that information out. So I'd like to end this presentation with a quote from Terry Dalton, who was our Loon Watch coordinator back in the 1990s. She said, the intensive nurturing, observation and protection provided to loons by volunteers across the continent is unprecedented. What loon rangers are protecting is not just loons, but a whole aesthetic, the loon, the forested shores, the clear cold water. Thank you all for listening and um, be happy to help to um, answer questions and, and maybe Caroline can, can speak about the, um, the educational materials that the Loon Preservation Committee has as well. Thank you so much, Erica. That was a really great presentation. Um, and you know, from the chat, it looks like most people watching here are from um, the East, particularly the Northeast, you know, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, but also North Carolina, Florida. We do have uh, at least one person from Minnesota here. So a little bit of that Midwestern uh, representation, but I think the primer that you provided was awesome and really set the scene for um, you know, all of the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for that. Um, to answer your question, yes, LPC does have um, fact sheets available on our website, loon.org. Um, you could also shoot me an email at volunteers at loon.org if anyone you know, who's in New England would like some of those. Um, and we do have some questions in the chat if you've got a little bit of time to stick around and answer those, sure. Erica. Great. So um, this question, I had the same one because I thought it was so fascinating when you brought up those eggs that were submerged underwater and then placed on land and still hatched. So the question here is, um, has that been documented anywhere online? Like, could someone find an article about that? Or is it something that's been more like orally passed around? This, um, I remember being in an email. Um, okay. So I, you know, I, at the time, I just didn't think to print this out and to, you know, use that as documentation. But um, I believe that that the eggs had not been in water underwater for more than six hours. Um, okay. So that it, you know, they, they don't know exactly how long they had been underwater, but they immediately took action. Um, but that's the only um, incidence that I know. I don't remember what lake it was or what loon ranger, if you're listening, <laughs> um, please contact me again and let me know. But, but I, yeah, I was amazed by that. Yeah, that's incredible. Really, really um, fascinating story. There are also some comments about the lack of uh, lead legislation in yeah. Wisconsin, but also other parts of the Midwest like Minnesota. 
Um, and so is there anything that members of the public can do to help in, you know, a push to get laws on the books? Or do you know if there are any plans on any of the states to try to get that to happen? Contact your local legislators and let them know what is important to you. Um, that's the best thing that you can do. Um, back in 2010, Loon Watch worked with Wisconsin's Conservation Congress and, um, and passed some, it wasn't legislation, but um, it was, it was sort of, or I, I don't remember the, the exact terms, but it was like ordinances that went on to the Natural Resources Board. And unfortunately they felt that they couldn't impose those restrictions on the people of Wisconsin. Um, right now, Minnesota has this really robust get the let out program. Hopefully that will, um, that will help. Um, I know I've talked to um, Susan Gallo from Maine Audubon um, and she said that really what it took was getting you know, people who, you know, high ranking folks like fishermen um, uh, to get involved and to, um, and to, you know, tout um, lead free fishing tackle. So, um, you know, I think, you know, part of it too is just us getting organized, um, probably getting organized with other organizations that are, um, that are trying to get the lead out as well. It's tough though, it's a tough sell. There's a lot of tradition when it comes to fishing here in the upper Midwest. There are people who make their own lead tackle. Um, so it's, um, it's a difficult thing to, to get off the ground. But the more people that know about the dangers of lead and what's happening, and they tell their local legislators, um, they tell their state legislators, let them know, hey, I'm upset about this. You know, it's just, it's the small lead tackle that we need to be concerned about. Um, maybe we can, we can make some changes, but it takes it takes a lot of people to, to, to do that. And if not, and if we don't have a huge constituency behind us, you know, it's just sort of shouting out. It's just, you know, us, our, our organizations shouting out there. Yeah, the um, New Hampshire lead ban and, and the legislation, you know, behind that and getting that passed happened before I started working at LPC, but my understanding that it was a similarly um, difficult thing to get past, although we did have, you know, some really nice public support um, and, and bipartisan support that made it possible here yeah. in New Hampshire. So I hope um, that works out for you guys uh, out West and, and, you know, that maybe members of the public who are watching here tonight can, can help out in that same way. Yeah. Um, we do have another <laughs> question back to um, that, that flooded nest or that where the eggs got swamped. Um, and the question uh, is a little bit specific. Um, do you know if they created a crude nest to lay those eggs? Like, or was it, did they just lay them on the bare ground? Um, here in New Hampshire, we sort of, and I probably, you guys do too, classify our nests as either a scrape or a bowl. Yeah, right? yeah. So, and I, I think that they did create something so that the eggs wouldn't roll off into the water, mm -hmm. um, but it was right next to, um, right next to the water. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what they did, but the description was, you know, we just put them adjacent to where they were nesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here in New Hampshire, uh, this past July, especially in Southern and Western parts of the state, it was uh, the highest level, you know, the, the wettest July that we've had on record. Wow. Um, and we did, you know, we had quite a number of nests fail in that way. And I remember our Monadnock region biologist sending me a picture of this nest mm. that was beautiful. It was a nice, big, beautiful bowl. And even that was several inches underwater. Oh. Um, it's crazy what that, those, yeah, yeah. That, that really intense rain period can do and how quickly water levels can rise on certain lakes and ponds. Yes. And if it continues to be wet, the water levels stay there. So that's, yeah. Climate change yeah. problem. It was a tough year, and uh, you know, in addition to the floodings this year, we also had one instance where um, this crazy current was created on this lake, and it actually swept the male loon of the pair over the dam and down a stream. You know, uh, not quite a mile, but pretty far, and he had to be rescued, and because he had, you know, weak old chicks that were depending on him. So, you know, wow. I, I mean, the nest flooding is the thing we're most concerned about, but other crazy things can happen when you have. Um, you know, these, these dramatic precipitation events. Yeah, there, there was actually something similar that happened in Northern Wisconsin too, where um, a dam went out and um, they had, the Loon family had to be re relocated to an adjacent lake. 
um, I heard more about craziness that. ensued after that. But yeah, yeah, Kevin and yeah. Linda went and rescued them. Yeah, that that was a crazy story and a really incredible yeah. rescue by Kevin and Linda Linda Grenzer. Yeah. Uh, amazing work by those two. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I think I've heard that like the Loon family did fine after that, right? They were out, they all were together on the new lake and they had fine until the fireworks. And then one of the chicks was hit by fireworks and had a severe burn and um oh, hurt its oh. eye and had to go to Reggie. So yeah. Oh yeah, it was, bad it was for tragic. that Loon family this year. Yep. Yep. Boy, I haven't, I don't think we've, uh, knock on wood, we haven't had a, a fireworks related injury to our loons yet here in New Hampshire that we've heard about anyway, but. Oh, that's wow. good. Yeah, that's it was, some... it was not a, a great situation for those loons. They, they endured a lot. And, um, the, the chick had to be, um, kept at Reggie, um, for a long time. Um, a lot of times the, um, parents won't take a loon chick back, um, after it's gone for, you know, more than three days or so. So mm -hmm. they had to release okay. it when it got a little bit bigger on a different lake with another loon that was also being rehabilitated. Wow. Yeah. Well, the folks at Reggie do some great work too. I know they, uh, they get a lot of loons in and take good care of them there. Yeah, Marge is magic when it comes to rehabilitating loons. <laughs> um, so question about, loon productivity. So in your loon counts across all of Northern Wisconsin, are you seeing a similar drop in the number of chicks hatched and surviving um, that Walter's seeing in, you know, his, his county? You know, our population, because, um, because it occur, our population survey occurs on one day. And so there's a lot of fluctuation um, because it's a one day survey. So we're not, we're not really catching what Walter is catching. Right. And he's just doing this much more intensive work um, with banded loons. So he's catching a lot more data and information. And if someone would like to um, sign up to be a loon ranger, what should they do? And, and what's the process like? Is there training or what, what can people expect? Yep. So they go to our website and there, there's a form where they sign up. And um, I reply um, with, um, with information and um, and links to our training workshop so they can watch the training workshop right away or they can attend a training workshop in the spring. Um, we encourage them to do that, it's not necessary. Um, in the spring, they will receive a packet that includes um, really detailed instructions, a monitoring form, a lake map, and, um, and information about um, other training opportunities and presentations that are gonna be given that, that year, as well as the report for, for the previous year. So um, yeah, anyone who wants to sign up um, on breeding lakes in Northern Wisconsin can do so. If, um, if you want to monitor the loons that are passing through in Southern Wisconsin, we encourage you to sign up for Journey North. Um, that's an organization based at the UW and, um, and they take information. They, um, they want ice out information as well as um, first um, observation of loons. And you can, that's a really great um, a great organization to participate in. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Journey North because they are uh, incredible and in doing some really great work there as well. Yep. Well, it looks like we are at the end of our list of questions and we're right about eight o'clock. So um, I think we'll end here. But Erica, again, thank you so much for giving us some of your time and teaching us about Wisconsin and, and, you know, the upper Midwest and the loons and the loon programs there. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. It was my pleasure. And for everyone watching this, if you'd like to watch again, or if you know of a friend or family member who might enjoy this presentation, it has been recorded. It will remain on LPC's YouTube channel so that you can refer back to it at any time. Um, and thanks so much everyone for joining us.